<clears throat> hey, what's up, everybody? How's everybody doing today on this Sunday? Kind of an impromptu thing. Impromptu live. Impromptu live. What's up, man? What's going on, Ben? Uh, I am in Atlanta, Georgia, to do the shooty things this week. Hot Atlanta. You went straight there from Virginia, didn't you? I did. I did. Yeah. And then from here to Kentucky, <laughs> then I'll be seeing you for the whatever the SWAT thing we've got in uh, California, yep. wherever that is. Yep. Yeah, we got Anaheim for two days, so should be good. It's going to be a banger. Should we uh, talk some shit for a while? Dude, that's what, so we just had a conversation. We did. Where Ben uh Ben made a post. Oh my pities, my pities are outside, I'm sorry. Putting uh so you, you say the post. What were you put who were you putting on notice? I was like, hey, what's going on? Uh oh, I wasn't putting anyone fight. on notice. I was well, I guess you could say I was putting everyone on notice. All these fucking USPSA BOCs, these tactard guys. They should be on notice. But I wanna say, like, uh with all this Mike Glover stuff. I went back around, took a took a hard look at the YouTube channel, the stuff that he's been putting out for the last couple of years. My spidey sense is really tingling, Matt. It's really tingling. The way that Dude. he's watching this combat footage, calling it like a football game. Um, I'll tell I'll tell you what, it's there's there's nobody else in this industry that is more of a scared little fucking child than that guy. And you see it where he just made a a video that was referencing some some knife stuff right his uh how unrealistic knife shit is or or whatever like blade training and guys that do blade training and it's it's an obvious it's an obvious retort or rebuttal to things that are going on right that he doesn't know about or or it, he, he can't relate to him so it's the attack right this is the guy that is is everything's toxic, everything's whatever, unless it's spewing out of his fucking mouth, right? Scared little right. fucking child, scared little baby, huge following, building his little cult of fucking echo chamber nonsense. And and now he, he, he's got the YouTube channel, he's got the platform, right? So I think it's worthwhile to, hey, by all means, still, Mike, I know you're, you're watching this through some of your, your spoof accounts or your guys. By all means, let's do a live. Let's talk about it because where... The rubber meets the road. Like now, you've got to have a conversation with consequence with me. Not that I'm anybody. Not that it it should matter. But hey, I'm the only one calling you out. Like let's let's fucking talk and let's Matt, talk I, about it, some of the shit that you say. Well, yeah. One of the things that you might want to ask him about, I saw on his channel he was talking about these multiple gunfights inside of structures that he's been in, that he's been involved in, and that to saying, me. That sounded, I mean, does that make the hair kind of stand up? You're like, oh, that's, you're like, those, that's an unusual circumstance for a guy in that line of business, you know, to be having that a lot of times, you know what I mean? It is. And for a lot of these dudes, it becomes, it's, it's a, it's a copy of a copy of a copy, or I don't even know if the story is your story or if it's someone else, it's a regurgitated story for the sake of training or whatever. But I would say, like, I've said it plenty of times for me personally and and like the amount of times that i could talk to hey i had a no shit gunfight in a structure where i went into a room not knowing someone was in there we exchanged rounds in a 26 year career for all the shit i did maybe five times so where the fuck does all this experience come from like I where mean is it at least warrants a conversation because you use it as the teaching point for all of your things, right? It's, it, it always defaults back to, I just saw somebody sent me a video where his EDC is like, I use green beret EDC. Like you use all these buzzwords. Like, let's talk about this. Are you a fucking marketing company or a training company? Right. Yeah. Cause in my opinion, you're a marketing company. Well, I think you might be right about that, Matt. And I'm just, I mean, me just, I, I'm nobody either. I'm less of somebody than you. And I'm, uh, my spidey sense tingles watching some of that stuff. I think Mike Lover might be, might be telling some fibs. It wouldn't shock me to learn that. 
Well, I mean, I know for a fact he stole plenty of fibs in terms of telling everybody he was an operator. I literally just trained with a department who told me firsthand. He stood up here and said, hey, I was an operator from this place. Like, and it was like, okay, let's move on. Let's keep training, like whatever. <laughs> so that, that, that's the teaching point, right? And, and I've got plenty of dirty knowledge about that dude and his history with field craft and that shit, where it started of and, and how it pinged on my radar. I would love to have the conversation. Unfortunately, he could probably only watch, watch this through his ghost accounts and his troll accounts uh, because I'm blocked. So, well, one day, probably one saw day how that, you saw it when with Travis. He probably doesn't want to do a live with you now. One day it might happen. We might. It might. So, so we were, uh, we also had a conversation. Uh, get back into the trolling thing we'll take some questions here for this impromptu live about um rifle pistol training right in terms of ratios i got a great question from a guy that was talking about how much time uh, if you run a rifle as a primary and a pistol as a secondary how are you dividing up your training what kind of skills do you lean on in terms of developing you know, kind of cross the board skills in terms of shooting, you know, visual grip, mount, all that stuff. What are you leaning on in terms of a ratio? And this would be a good one for you because as high level pistol shooter and all of the stuff that we trained, you know, a couple years ago with rifle and the work you've done up until now, like, where do you see the balances or if you had to assign a balance for you, right? You had tons of pistol skill, and then you got into the rifle thing. Where do you see that ratio working out? Like, could you even assign a number to that? Like, how much percentage pistol versus rifle, or where do you put your emphasis? Well, I, I would say for me, um, I like if I wanted, like, when I want to develop rifle skills primarily, which I would like, to, like, that's where I'm at right now. Even though I'm teaching pistol courses on the road right now, I'm still. I would like to develop the rifle shooting. Uh, what I what I've been doing is going to the range and shooting rifle first. I mean, and not that much. It doesn't need to be that much. A hundred, two hundred rounds, depending on what I'm doing, and then I can switch to pistol for training. And then I dry fire my rifle first and dry fire that primarily. Uh, I yeah. think you need fundamentally. I think you need to shoot the rifle less to get really proficient with it. But for me, and this probably I think for most people, I need to dry fire it a lot more. But I I don't need to as much live ammo through it. Yeah, through the rifle. Yeah. I think there has to be a certain amount of, like, kind of exploratory time where you understand the recoil. And now when you say not shoot a lot of rounds, like, I know the week we shot rifle. Shot a lot, yeah. I mean, we, we shot 15, 16,000 rounds in a week. And you you got some... Yeah, between both of us. Between yeah, both. we got a good base. So I think you need to shoot a lot to get a base of what you're doing. Like the the the, the marksmanship stuff we're always doing, doubles, practical accuracy, those types of things. You have to shoot a lot to get a feel and get acclimated to what the gun's going to do under recoil. Learn some semblance of what you think your mount should feel like and how that should behave. But then it comes down to dry firing that mount, dry firing transitioning, manipulations, reloading, you know, ready up, all, all of that sort of stuff. Like, that's where you put in a lot of work. And for me, I haven't found I need a ton of rounds to confirm right. that I can do that stuff. But I need yeah. a lot of training time. A lot of, yeah. Train, and this is where, like, training time versus total rounds, like, total resources, right? I'll give way more of my resources in terms of time and dry fire and, and things like that to until live fire. Because... Now it starts costing like big money. So in when you're dry firing, Ben, I had a, just a good question was asked. Um, how many times is it okay? Are you to, are you failing in dry fire? Right with, and we'll we'll talk about rifle primarily. Like, are you are you failing where it's okay? Like, hey, I recognize I just missed that one. Are you scaling back to what's controlled? Or are you continuing to push? So that's a good question. What I found, and there's actually independent research on this, independent of shooting. And where, what you want to do, you want to push yourself hard enough that you fail about 15, 20% of the time, whatever that is to you. And now fail can be, you know, defined any way you want. 
So if I'm doing, uh, for example, I was doing a, a drill the other day with a target straight down range, one at 90 degrees this way, one at 90 degrees that way, and transitioning around with the rifle, which as you that, that's extremely difficult, right? To do that quickly with, you know, it's easier with a pistol when you have swings that big, but I'm working on big swings with the rifle. So a fail for me was just over swinging an aim point a little bit. I would be like, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a bad rep. So I was going, I would go aggressively enough that like four out of five times, I, I, it looks okay. It looks basically yeah. okay. And then if you, what, what you'll find is that if you fail more than that, you kind of are training to fail or you're training to pass through. But if you're successful all the time or you always assess reps as good, then you're not really growing. Either right. you're not paying attention or you're not getting better. It's one of the two. Right. And I, I think there's a lot to the last thing you said, like, hey, paying attention, right? To me, what I learned over, you know, probably like halfway through, once I was kind of establishing dry fire, I made a ton of mistakes at the beginning. And what I realized the real benefit was, was I, I articulated like objectively assessing what the sites are doing while it's happening. Mm -hmm. And then as long as I'm doing that is I'm a, I'm assessing what the sites are doing while it's happening and I can make those corrections. I don't ever slow down. And what that ends up being is like a 60, 40, 50, 50. 50 50 kind of split with fails and wins. But, but the more important thing is that I'm aware of what's going on with that dot or the irons. If I'm doing, you know, my production gun or an, an optic gun, I'm aware of what's happening the whole time. And then I ratchet up and ratchet down. But yes, if I'm, if I miss a mark in terms of precision, control, aggression, or the time, however I'm dry firing, if I miss that mark like three out of 10 times, I start to consider maybe changing that mark or changing the input that I'm putting into it. You kind of find the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And uh, well, that, I find the same thing for me, but for the audience, what I find for students is that they do not assess their dry fire correctly or rigidly and I'll say some, yeah. I say this all the time. It sounds nuts to people. If you do your dry fire and you always assess it as good, or you're like, yep, good rep, good rep, good rep the whole time. There's no way. Doing, yeah, exactly. Like you're not doing it right. You're either too slow, too soft. Yeah. Or you're not, you're, or you're more likely you're just assessing, you're, you're not assessing the, the movement in the sights when you're working the trigger. You're, you're not seeing that stuff or you think it's okay. You think it's not a big deal. Whatever. You, do you think that's that's one of the hardest things for shooters to do is to objectively assess themselves at the appropriate level, right? I see it both ways. Like some guys are like, it's always good and it's always brushing their own hair. And mm -hmm. that was amazing. Or it's overtly negative that that can also kind of crush the training pathway. It does. There'll be guys that are negative about every single thing they do all the time. Never good enough. But I mean, it's at a point where they let they lose perspective, where it's yeah. like, yeah, I understand that this what you're trying to do right now is not perfect. But if you kind of zoom out to a 30,000 foot view relative to other people, you're very proficient at this skill set and you're probably banging your head against the wall right now for no real reason or purpose. So so how much does do you think the social media vibe fucks people train people's training up <laughs> social media? I don't know. It's fucked up every other dimension of our society. Like, yeah, it's probably so, not great for people's training either. So like when you, you see something, right. And I've, I'll tell a train a bunch of people and you see like, well, this wasn't really where I wanted to be. And I'll watch videos and, and get the time breakout from them. And I'm like, you understand like, that's like, you're drawing to, a partial target at 12 yards at 1.2 seconds. That's pretty fucking good. Yeah. That's suspiciously good as a matter of fact, but their, their mentality of where they want to be because of what they see on fucking Instagram and YouTube, it's skewed to where like, you don't even understand what, like, I think it was probably better when you probably had to, you had to actually read a book rather than watch a video in terms of get information because guys would understand like 
I know uh, the first time I shot with Rob Latham, Rob Latham, he was like, hey, if you're consistently drawing to an A zone and 1.2, 1.3 seconds at 10 yards, move on to something else. Like, there's, you're not gaining a lot in terms of the practical world by nailing down that skill. But what do you see in the social media world is a lot of one second draws, a lot of kind of flash in the pan type activity that looks really good, but that's one run out of a bunch probably. And I yeah, think that yeah. that's Instagram. People's... I, well, I can tell you this, what I see on Instagram, the videos that people really want to watch, if it's a shooting video, it's up close, it's fast, you know, a lot of brass kicking out of the gun, that kind of stuff. People get hard for that. That's what they want to see. So that's what, you know, guys put up. And then, you know, you and I see things through a pretty critical eye. So I'll see a video of a dude drawing a gun. I can tell his grip is a little bit fucked up, but he's, you know, three, four yards away from the target on Instagram and he's you know, shooting and making it work. But I'm watching that. I'm like, yeah, he's not going to do that in a match or he's not going to do that if we really score it. Or he's not going to do that if it matters. No, I agree. And I'll tell you, like, I, I just – I spend the bulk of my time training at like, I would say the closest target that I shoot in terms of like, I just did designated, designated target drill. And the targets were kind of 12 to 19 yards, you know, maybe slightly longer on some of the angled stuff. But to me, the, the 12 yard designated target that I was coming back to all the time, that was the throwaway. It doesn't look sexy on Instagram, right? You film it, you got to, pan way out but when when i watch it i watch people shooting like that and you're like that's fucking impressive they're like oh that didn't look that good i was like well i know exactly what it takes to put two alphas two inches away from each other at 15 yards at that pace like that's remarkable and i think a lot of guys don't get that from the ig or the the social media world well, what I see is people come to class and they see shooting lot like live demonstrations in person and they always always have a they always looks different to them than they, they thought it would look um, over the internet. For take that for whatever it's worth. I'm oh, sure you yeah. get the same feedback from people. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's uh and I think that's where you don't want I don't ever want anybody to show up and shoot with me in a class to be like, Hey, uh um, this shit wasn't really what I thought it was going to be. You know what I mean? Like, well, they say that, but it's not in the direction that you think. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. All right, here's a good one, man. Uh, ben, how much competition is too much? I'm shooting matches two to three times a week, dry fire three times a week. Is that too much? Yes. I. I mean, it, I think. I mean, for for. If you're talking for me, just raw skill development, um, that's too much. If you enjoy shooting matches and you're going and shooting just for the fuck of it, that's like a different thing. Um, what was really good for me, I felt, was not over competing. So when I was really, really developing hard, I tried to shoot one match a month. But I'd be all in on that match. Six stage club match, like I'm all in. You know what I mean? Like mentally, yeah. emotionally. Like I'm going to like, I'm going to try to crush yeah. that as hard as I can. And what I find is I can shoot that match. I can assess how did it go? Where do I think my skills are at? I can make a new training plan. I have time to implement that plan over the course of a few weeks. And then I can shoot another match. If you're not in a cycle where you're like implementing lessons you've learned in a really systematic way or changing up your training, you're just going and going match, 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 match. Like that's not, that's, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know I, what that is. Yeah, I think it's. I think you're you're if if you're shooting that much, you're not being as critical as you probably should be in terms of the training side. I experienced the same thing, probably for different reasons, right? I could only when I was got into USPSA is like, hey, I want to make GM. I could only shoot one match a month. It was all I had in terms of family time and everything. I was I was shooting every day for work. I was dry firing to the point where like I joke about it with some people that shit was about to end my marriage but one match a month was all I could do which was why like it took me eight matches to make GM and I had to I shot 
you know, some good classifiers, was doing really good, was winning club matches. None of them were majors. They're just club club type stuff. And I looked at those matches, though, like they were national because this was the test, right? I did all this dry fire, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of hours of dry fire, hundreds and hundreds of hours of live fire in between matches. So when I went to execute what I thought I could do, it had to be perfect or near perfect, right? If I, if I didn't win my division, I literally wanted to fucking kill myself. Like I was pissed, right? <laughs> if I didn't, if I didn't shoot, you know, close to a hundred on the classifier, that was a fail. If I wasn't in the top five shooting production in a club match, you know, I wasn't happy with that. And I would take all that stuff back the same way you did. Like, hey, this is what you have to work on, right? Like, why in the fuck are you uh, at this level and some open shooter who's a C-class guy or B-class guy is beating you in terms of time? And I really got into the metrics. And for me, it was good to take that stuff back to training and kind of drive how my training was doing. Yeah, uh, I'm the same way. So when I when I go to a club match, I'm an hour early and I'm there to like destroy. I mean, to me, like I want to shoot every stage like, you know, good. I want to do I don't want to do well. I don't go shoot matches. I don't give a fuck about I don't go shoot when I'm not prepared to compete, you know, that kind of stuff. Like that's not fun to me and it's not, it's not going to help me grow. Yeah. <laughs> I got a good one in there for you, Matt. What's up? We get people want to hear the review of uh, Tim Kennedy's movie. Send me, we're going to do it. You're going to give, I haven't watched it either. So I want to curious your thoughts. I haven't watched it, man. I was obviously like there involved in that when, that shit dude that guy's a fucking clown like it's i thought he saved the day no he you tim kennedy made that situation more difficult they showed up their traveling road what? show their what? bullshit activity right it's pr stunt whatever it's what? and then all the credit like oh we brought back ten thousand people like i hate to tell you tim you did nothing other than ride a plane to fucking H. Kaya and got over and then did a bunch of things that were super dangerous that made it dangerous for a lot of U.S. service members, right? What? So it's, it, it's a fucking PR stunt, right? It's where you're like, you're a marketing company. You're a personality. You're an internet fucking celebrity. That's it. If your leading thing is like, like how many times do you hear it? Tim Kennedy, Green Beret, Special Order Sniper, good for you. The most remarkable thing you fucking did was you were a UFC fighter. Lead with that, dude. Like, your Green Beret shit, no one gives a fuck about. Get over it. it just stop. It's yeah, he's Hold on, hold on. Nick Young saying, but Tim looks so cool on the ground. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. He did look good on Instagram. He does. Saving the right? Afghan people. Yeah, dude, I'm like, he's the most legit thing about him. He's like, dude, you're a, you're a legitimate Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and a UFC fighter. That is remarkable in itself. That's amazing. Lead with that. Get off your other shit. Cause it's all bullshit. Like no one gives a fuck about it. Well, yeah, that was a good little sidetrack. People like a little bit of the trolling. So I thought like, you guys, I thought he was, you were going to talk to him at TTPOA. I was trying to get drunk Matt together so, with Tim Kennedy. And it didn't happen. I was he, never sad. he never showed up, man. He, he showed up there. That's where the thing, like at TTPOA, it was, you book a class and then there, he was like, well, we didn't know this or that. And he sends this whole little sheep, dog, crony, herds, whatever the fuck they're doing. But it's not him. He didn't show up. Like we had, we had exchanges back and forth where I was like, yeah, I'm going to be at TTOP. I can't wait to see you. And he's like, yeah, looking forward to it. I would love it. Like I was excited me... to watch. I had my camera ready to go. And yeah, you know. I'm like, I don't shy away from that. It would be amazing for me to meet the, the celebrity, him and Marcus Luttrell. That would be awesome. Marcus. Well, well, that's another guy that you watch some footage of him telling that story. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that story is not true. Just based on 
Yeah. Well, let's just say I've got a good bullshit detector. When you, you talk about, my... yeah, the, the look on his face when he's describing the death of like his friends, I don't believe what he's saying. What I'm really curious is Marcus is stepping away from his own foundation. Huh. Lone Survivor Foundation. I just saw that on, on social media. So that's an interesting topic. Like, why that are you leaving it? Like, whatever, hero. Like, hopefully it's catching up to you. All right. What other questions we got? You seen any good ones? Um, no, people just love the trolling. They want the pit vipers. I'm sorry, guys. The pit vipers are outside. I have ordered some more pairs. We're going to have more color options soon. I know that's important. <laughs> Elmer's Fudworks wants to make his own shooting sport and have backpacks and hookers. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not going to be – I mean, right now in USPSA, just, the, just the, the board guys get all the hookers, and we get nothing. You know? We should have everyone get hookers or something. I mean, it's more fair. It's it really low, like, segments the amount of people that come to a match. I'm probably not going to matches with hookers. That might be hey, an issue for my family. I was at a match once, actually, where they had Hooters girls come out and uh, reset stages. I shit you not. It was in Texas a while back, but there was Hooters girls out there. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I Dude, thought it classed it up a little bit. My wife doesn't even like it when I shoot in your gentleman's club hat that you gave me. <laughs> oh, no, no female likes it when I shoot in that hat, which is why I, I shoot in that hat a lot. Yeah. All right. What do you guys got for uh, – Seal's exaggerating what? Yeah, big surprise. Well, all right, Matt, then, you should write a book. What do you okay. recommend – never happened. What do you recommend for transition drills? Like if you're going out to work on is there one of the, one of the drills from practical shooting or, or PSDG that you like specifically for transitions? Uh, well, there's a lot that I like, but uh, let's just say people, it depends on how advanced you are, but for most people, they're going to have some weak points in their target transition game. So there's a, uh, there's a, a drill called designated target that, that once it came up with, basically all you do is you put out a smorgasbord of targets spread out in front of you, different distances, difficulties, different transition, you know, degrees of swing between targets. And it's like the way I set it up in class is like, there's a steel target straight down range and then targets just angle off at different distances and configurations, right? So it might be head shot at 15, wide open target at five yards. That's a few degrees offset. And you go back and forth, you know, target here, target there, target here, target there, with a lot of different types of targets. And what that shows you is where you have a weak point, you know? Uh, am I weak transitioning onto precise targets? Am I weak at wider transitions? Am I too conservative? when I go on to the closer, like more aggressive targets that I could shoot more aggressively, you know, it'll reveal to you weak points that you have in your game. And then you can drill that stuff more specifically. Yeah. So that, that's a good one. So the thing that, that I get a lot of is, is guys are like, hey, what drill for this? What drill for that? The drill doesn't matter. Like a lot of guys within that Instagram world you want set targets at this distance or whatever, so you have metrics. The thing you have to focus on is what the takeaway of the driller exercise is, right? I don't care if the targets are, if it's bunny stacks or I have two targets that are five yards apart and one that's 10 yards apart, it's three, it's four, it's five. What are you trying to get out of it, right? In terms of transitions, I want to stop the gun I want to move the gun as aggressively as I can and stop the gun as precisely as I can. And I measure the result against that process. Do you kind of look at it the same way, Ben? Like, Yeah, so a good way of putting it is that there's a lot of dudes, especially guys that are willing to work. They have that work ethic. They have that drive. They want to do reps to fix everything. They're just like reps, reps, reps. That's, what they, that's the world. That's their headspace is I'm going to yeah. do more reps. And what they need to hear is like, dude, it's not about how many reps you do. It's about paying attention and focusing on like, and actually fixing a problem. Like, hey, I get too tense doing this. Or, hey, my eye's not grabbing a spot on the target yeah. when I do this thing. And it's like, you need to actually work, like put your brain on fixing your problem. 
rather than just doing more reps. And that's kind of what you're saying. You're like, hey, the drill, it's not really about the drill. It's about putting your brain on fixing the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever the, whatever the setup is, is kind of irrelevant. Now, a lot of guys want it because they want the feedback of, of a total time, right? Like that's the way the gram works. I shot three, three targets at these distances with headshots. And this was my time. If my time falls within whatever somebody arbitrarily assigned as a standard, whether it was the movie Sicario or some fucking antiquated Miami Vice video, like where the guy Jerry does, does a failure, failure drill, they look at that as that's the validation. And in my opinion, you're looking at training the wrong way. Like, it's not the total time. It's what are you taking away from a specific exercise? What are you trying to isolate and what are you trying to get better at? And that's really what, how I look at like my shooting is I take these little tiny things and I drive them into the ground, right? Break them, rebuild them back up. And then that becomes a fundamental. I like that. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to something else before. So if this cuts off, if it cuts off, I don't know how long we've been on. Are you tracking the time, Ben? Not even a little. I don't All think right. it's been that long. If it cuts off, I will immediately come back on to do a wrap up and see if Ben is available. So let's talk. Can about you talk about Clint Smith and Hackthorn being wrong? And what are they wrong about? They're not wrong. They're irrelevant. Not to be a dick, but you know, yeah. like in the, the circles you Matt and I run in, like those names don't come up. Nobody gives a fuck about them. It's the same as Travis Haley. When we talked to him the other day, like not to be a dick, but nobody's talking about stuff that Travis Haley's putting out. He can have all the ocular tracking systems he wants. He's yeah. just not relevant to the conversation. Dude, I'll talk about Ken Hackathorn. What is he wrong about? Almost everything. Pick a topic that comes out of his mouth. Almost everything. What is Clint Smith wrong about? Literally almost everything. Like Clint Smith is, he's a Pat McNamara fucking show. You're going there for the experience, right? You're going to the multi-million dollar Thunder Ranch to shoot the camouflage fucking targets. And you're going there to be yelled at through a guy with a fucking boom mic because he can't talk and teach from behind the line. Like, so what's he wrong about? Literally everything. Ken Hackathorn, the same way. Uh, Bill Wilson, same fucking thing. Every time someone sends me a Bill Wilson or Ken Hackathorn video where they're sitting there talking about shooting. Like, what are you wrong about uh, shooting? <laughs> I just heard one where Bill Wilson was like, you don't need to practice. Like, everyone should practice with their pistol at three to five yards and closer. Like, okay, so that clearly shows me you fucking don't know about shooting. You're probably amazing at building really good guns, but in the shooting world, please just stop talking. Ken Hackathorn, like, dude, let's, where does Ken Hackathorn's experience come from? He hung out with some dudes that were doing some things and shooting back in the 70s and 80s. Like, outside of that, it's, he bills himself as, like, the, the number one soft trainer and shit like that. Like, where did you come from? Never been in soft, never been a law enforcement guy, never been anything. Like, where... You're just an enthusiast. Wait, he does? He builds himself as the number one soft trainer? Dude, go to Ken Hackathorn's website and look at him. Like, Holy his shit. whole, all of his accolades is how much he trains soft and his connection to soft. Okay, cool. Maybe that's a thing. But, but how can he, if he's like read in at these different units and signing non disclosures, as I'm sure he would have to do if he's training all these high speed units, he can't talk about the specifics of that shit anyway. No, but also, not that you know. I know. Know, like, oh, what am I, I know, talking about here? Not that my my history goes back. It goes goes back to 1994. At no point were we ever like, who are we bringing in? Um, let's see if Ken Hackathorn is available. That never happened. Oh, let me see. Is Bill Wilson doing anything? Can he come work with us with pistol? That never oh, how happened. About, how about where the fuck Packers? are you? Wasn't he the wasn't he the radio guy handing out radios and then shooting Dude. himself in the foot and lying about it, Matt? 
Fucking two lamb. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. When Get two it, lamb man. when two lamb <laughs> sees it on his little ghost account too, let's do a live. Let's do it, buddy. Like we can do a three way with you and Mike and you guys can gang up on me. I won't have Ben on. We, no one else has to come on, just me and you. You can bring your wife on and whatever. You can do all that stuff. Two Lamb is legit, says I'm up. Oh, I, but I outright, okay. But what? I, I thought he like legitimately shot. I thought he legitimately ventilated his foot. Dude, that's Jamie Tillot. He's, uh, he's fucking with you. I know. He, I know he's fucking with me. He's fucking right. with the whole chat. Let's talk about practical accuracy. So I just did a post. Um, I did at the end of my session, right? I shot uh, just under 100 rounds of practical accuracy. I did it all from 20 yards. And then I shot about 180 rounds of doubles with the new pistols from 20. So in my opinion, practical accuracy in doubles is if I, if I had 100 rounds to train, 60 of those rounds are going to one of those two drills. Like, I, that's, that's how important I think they are. I totally agree. And from a training perspective, like, so, so for dudes who don't know, doubles is ba like, basically, this is the drill. Point the gun at aim point, shoot the gun twice fast, experience, understand, feel what happens, you know, yeah. repeat, improve your technique, visual focus, grip technique, all that stuff, learn how to control your gun. That's so important. Because that's like 90% of shooting. If you if you could like, separately train transitioning the gun or drawing the gun. So basically getting the gun to the target, whether you have to move or transition it or reload it, whatever the fuck you got to do. But once the gun's there, the shooting part, it's double drill for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like in, in terms of like, I like practical accuracy with doubles, right? I think doubles is the emphasis to learn how to, how to fix fundamental skills, like foundational skills with the pistol doubles is going to get you there much, much faster. And then understanding doubles, step one, understanding practical accuracy for tactical shooters, step two, and then learning how to blend them. Right. Because so Ben, you wrote practical accuracy. You came up with that drill. So from your mouth, like conceptualizing, hey, reacting, it's reactive shooting, reacting to every single sight picture and learning how to react faster. Like, how do you explain practical accuracy to people? Well, I, the way I, I package it is like when you're shooting quickly, you have a desire to go fast and be accurate. Um, practical accuracy is a good simulation for what's going to happen. So if you have uh, guys in any, like if, if they're trying to shoot a, a, a shot, they consider difficult. So they're going to swing the gun, put the sight on the target, and then they see the sight flash where they want to hit. And then boom, they whack the trigger, right? That's yep. what guys do. Cause they have a desire to go fast. All right. The most common problems are going to dive down into the gun. You know, they'll push the gun down, but yeah. there could be other things that are wrong too. But the whole idea with practical accuracy is to create that circumstance where you're shooting fast and you're kind of influencing the gun, pushing the gun around as you're doing it. So you create that circumstance and isolate it so you can work through it and improve rather than just, you know, keep having problems. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that that's where I think too, a lot of guys have a problem with, with practical accuracy, even with a long drawn out explanation of like, Hey, we're reacting to every single sight picture. When you see it, yep. you have to press the trigger. The time is set by you. Right. And then, and then balancing it with, are you over aiming? Are you over confirming? If your group looks like a fist at 12 or 15 yards, the really, the only critique is, Hey, you got to speed up a little bit, react sooner, see faster kind of thing. A lot yeah, of guys so, struggle yeah. with that. The hard part for the drill is you need the right amount of push. And guys want to focus on specific metrics rather than giving themselves the push. So here's a good example for you. When you're shooting your Glock, like the gun, you work at a different pace. The trigger's heavier. It's a longer throw. The gun is lighter. 
So you're going to shoot that gun a different pace than your new CZs. 100%. Right? Yeah. So what dudes have a hard time with is when they're shooting a CZ, it's like, no, I still, you still push right to the limit, right to where you start creating issues, where you start influencing the gun. It's just when you have a easier to shoot gun, you need to go faster and you need to be further away in order to create the same problems. And what guys like to do is get a better gun and then shoot the same pace as the other gun and then think that they're better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. I, I 100% know. So if we had to assign a metric, right? So I know the book answer, right? Where I would say out past, so 12, 15, 17, 20 yards, practical accuracy kind of, if you were to measure it, re, you're reacting to every single sight picture. We would expect expect split times that are 0.3, three tenths and above. Anything faster than three tenths, I think we start getting into predictive. Correct. Yeah. Regardless of what you can articulate. So, so three tenths and above. Now, in terms of an accuracy standard, I know when I shoot practical accuracy, it's 100% alpha. Because you're shooting your vision. You're shooting when the site, when the acceptable level of confirmation, the acceptable aiming scheme is there, you pull the trigger. So the accuracy standard has to be 100%. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? I do. No, I do. And I, I actually tell people, like, I don't even give a fuck about the A zone because I'm training you or you should be training yourself to look at a small spot, a coin size spot on the target. So if we're doing practical, I mean, practical accuracy, five, seven, 10, 15 yards with, with the guns that people are using for competition, it's like, yeah, the a, yeah, of course you can hit the A zone. I want your vision driven to a small spot where you're really shooting with a desire to hit a spot the size of a coin. So it's funny too, because we've separated on this, right? Where we're going we're gonna to explore this with, in Anaheim because the way that I went was I lead with predictive stuff. And, yeah, and, I like I, and you kind of, you're looking towards, uh, you know, group shooting, practical and building into predictive. Like, and, and you're the, it's funny because you're the one that got me into that. Like when we no. train together, you're like, I'm going to kick your ass in the deep end. And then I'm going to teach you how to swim. Right. Uh, so I, I like the way you do it. The, I, I, I do group shooting just, uh, especially in open enrollment classes, just like essentially to make sure people's guns are zeroed. Cause yeah. you don't know, you might have some fucked up people in there, but uh, like, I like, I just had this conversation with, you know, Andreas, I'm at his yeah. place. We just had this conversation. He's like, Hey, a lot of people can't do doubles in, the, in my fundamentals classes I'm doing. Cause they're not at that level. And doubles is too much. So I'm just like, I don't do too much doubles. We're just doing practical accuracy. And what I found is that even guys that are struggling on practical accuracy, just that sight press, sight press, sight press, you have them rip, you know, the, the, those fast pairs and they learn something about recoil control. They learn yes. how the gun's behaving as you force them to do that. So isn't that where, when Andreas is saying guys can't do doubles, Right. Kind of, I'm pushing like, them. I'm like, no, dude, even if they can't do it, they're going to learn. Have them do it. What I hear is, too, like, Andreas, as an instructor, like, you're outcome focused, not process focused. Fuck the target. Uh, like, that's what he wants. They can't do doubles. What do you mean? They can't pull the trigger as fast as they can? No, you can't get the result you want. But there's yeah. something. Move them closer to the targets. And what they're going to learn in terms of running that trigger hard is all of the things that the practical and tactical guys all need, right? You think of it yeah. like in terms of, I don't care what your, your best strategy for a match is or your, your strategy for uh, CCW engagement or law enforcement guys. When you're put in that context, whether the competitive, defensive, offensive, you're going to pull the trigger one way you're going to get excited on the practical side because you're like, I want to be fast. I just watched this motherfucker do pop, pop, pop. Like if you're shooting down at, at, uh, um, what's you're in Atlanta, right? Grand river mm -hmm. or big river, South river gun club or South river, river bend.
or Cherokee. So, Many interesting clubs around here. Right, but tons of GMs squirting bullets, right? Yes. Very fast, very accurate. And a, a new shooter comes up, and he's emulating that, right? Where the defensive guy is – the situation contextually is get you excited. The gun comes out. You pull the trigger one way. The, the LE guy reacts to a situation, goes on the offense. He pulls the trigger one way. It's all the same fucking way. It goes back to how fast are you pulling the trigger? Well, you're pulling it as fast as you can. Double. Yes. Yes. Conversation's uh, over. Doubles. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, I the the example I like is uh, I've seen Olympic swimmers. You know, I'm not an Olympic swimmer, obviously, but I've seen some footage. Uh, they have this machine that like pulls them through the water at, like 30 miles an hour, so they just can feel the water going by their body, and they can kind yes. of yes, you know, they can just feel experience it, you know. And it's doubles is kind of the same. It's like, no, just just shoot the fucking gun really fast in a controlled yeah. environment, a safe way, all that, you know, gay shit, of course. But you can feel what's happening and you're gonna learn from that. It's not Dude, about the outcome. In the tactical world, every you driving training, you do that. You go to any driving course, right? I've been I've been in the, the passenger seat of a bunch of Corvettes and everything with race car drivers. The first thing they do is they take you on a lap or two where they're driving to inoculate you, to show you, hey, this is what it's like. It's the same thing. It's like getting pulled through yeah. the water at 30 miles an hour. Now, the work in the training side of it is you've got to figure out how to pull yourself through the water at 30 miles an hour. Yes, but it's a valuable experience. Yeah, I, I agree. It's fucking, it's insanely valuable. What else you got uh, going on today? Transmitted dynamics. Well, that can happen. Well, oh, is that like kinesthetic awareness or what is that? Kinesthetic, uh, kinesthetic, uh, awareness kinesthetic or awareness. Or whatever. Yeah. I'm waiting to see when the STD comment would hit. Well, yeah. Well, it just hit. Why? Hey, Matt, here's a good one. Why, why emphasize training pistol for guys that are going to probably not even carry a pistol on target? So... For that, you have to think it's specific to a place I used to work, right? So much of, of our primary mission focus was tied to a pistol based off a of very specific mission set. What most guys found is getting really, really good with a pistol translates to a rifle. And I've said this before plenty of times, right? I've met plenty of shooters that are phenomenal rifle shooters that can't shoot a pistol worth a fuck. I have yet to meet a very good accomplished pistol shooter that sucks at rifle, right? Pistol ammo is a little bit cheaper. Some of the mechanics are a little bit easier in terms of body position. You can be a little bit looser. Um, the training is less stressful in terms of like exhaustive state, like where you're going to get at shooting 800 rounds of pistol vice 800 rounds of rifle. And that leans into it. But the, the skills, from my opinion, do translate, right? What you can do with a pistol in terms of grip and vision, I can tie that into what you do with a rifle. Vision stuff stays the same. Uh, whether Even whether you're shooting irons with a pistol or optic with a pistol. And then the mountain stuff, it just turns into a semantics, like a little bit different explanation. But the concepts are the same. What this hand's doing vice what this hand's doing it's the same thing yeah i well yeah i mean it's just like to to add on to that i can take a pistol if i have a 25 yard range 20 yard range take my glock out there shoot that you know different stuff it's going to be quieter which kind of matters it's cheaper it's you know i'm not walking around this i don't have to walk as far to like assess targets or pace targets the whole thing's easier if i want to get the same value like when when I'm shooting rifle, it's like, I just need more space. I'm walking down there to check targets more because I want to do shit right. Um, the ammo, I'm spending a lot more money. You know, the whole thing. Yeah. It's just, there. You're, you're developing. I'm working the same shit. I'm working on pulling the trigger straight, holding the gun properly, driving my vision to small spots on the target, being disciplined, all of that shit. I'm working on fundamentally the same skills, just in a much, much easier to digest package when it's a pistol. 
And you, you, Matt, and your colleagues understand this very well. So after a while, do you not, like, I, I feel this all the time about myself. Like, I start to sound like a broken fucking record. The skills are the same, right? Like, if, yes. if you fix grip and vision with pistol, and you fix mount, which is basically grip and vision with the rifle, we're eliminating like 99% of the foundational errors that people make. Like it's, it, it's really simple guys. Like there's, there's no, everybody wants a, well, what's this drill? What's that drill? The fucking drills don't matter. These are concepts that are really easy, right? Like take it to dry fire. Can you grip the fucking pistol correctly? Can you pull the trigger dry and not have the sight? the the front sight you know your sight picture or the optic move like an unnecessary amount right there's an acceptable amount of wobble but you refine that right you overdevelop those skills to where they get better and better and better and you take that and test it in live now you switch over to your rifle the grip is the same way right when i'm gripping a pistol this hand does all the work my support hand same thing with the rifle this is where all the work is now we can have nuanced discussions about how we hold it or whatever. But when you're shooting, whether it's a pistol or a rifle, hold that fucking thing the same way that a ransom rest holds it. It's consistent. It's locked in. It's secured. And it doesn't move. You don't, as you start shooting more and more aggressively, if the mount of a rifle is good, you don't have to apply more pressure to the rifle. Yeah. You've, ex you've experienced this, Ben, right? Yeah, and you don't have to apply more pressure. But the, the thing for me is when I was uh, when I was just holding the rifle with my you know support hand clamp, um, I found myself wanting to do things like let's say I'm shooting a fifty yard build drill, and I see the dot behaving, it's coming back, you know, it's coming it's it's coming back to the target. Then I'm like, oh well, I, I start wanting to tense up to make shit happen faster. So a yeah. big part of like the whole reason I hold the rifle the way I do is to stop myself from doing counterproductive shit. So I tense up my, uh, my firing side a lot more and that's, I tense it up just to stop myself from wanting to flex and push into the gun. And with yeah. my support hand, I roll my elbow down and pull in just so that if that pressure changes, like if I add more pressure to try to like help the rifle re re recover, all that's going to happen is it's going to keep behaving the same way. But if I'm pulling in, if I'm like pulling the gun left instead of in and down, if I pull left, now the dot starts behaving very differently and I start fucking myself. Yeah. I don't think there's, there's, you're never going to give any help to the gun to help it return faster. Exactly. You can't the, gun is, the gun's going to do its thing regardless of your input understand that your input is what's fucking the gun up right and guys that shoot with shoot rifle with me shoot rifle with ben you understand this like any mistake that happens on the target you fucking did it it wasn't and that's what we're constantly fixing is like hey if i can make the mount or the grip pistol grip mount of the rifle extremely solid extremely durable and consistent to last long engagement sequences that's the end game and that's that's the most simplest version i think of of talking about like this way of training it's there there doesn't need a lot more like oh well tweak this tweak that i don't give a fuck if you put your hand backwards on the rifle like this but if this is consistent and the gun doesn't move the results will be amazing. Yeah, the, the big thing with um, – guys have a hard time with the concept. Here's one thing I was talking with with pistol especially is, like, let go of the idea that you need to stop the gun from rising up. You don't need to do that. You don't need to stop the gun from rising. It's physics. It's going to rise. Yeah, You're you fighting a losing it. battle. Instead, you want it to behave predictably and consistently, and you understand how it's going to behave, and then you become very dangerous. With that thing i agree i agree with that all right what's the last troll thing what's on there 
What's the next one? Guys, uh, just throw some names in there. GBRS, uh, fucking, who do you want us to talk about? Anybody. Like, so throw out your, your least favorite tactical trainer. There was, I'm like, sure a Matt Tony, or I and or Tony I. Cowden. Tony Cowden. He's not, he's not a tactical trainer. He's just a fucking loser. I mean, we need. Tony Cowden is a tactical trainer in his own mind. He's also a, a grandmaster <laughs> factory, from what I understand. That got Have shut you... down. Yeah. Ronin oh. Tactics. You need to have compassion in your heart, guys. Samurai you need to boy. meditate. Right after I shut this off, I'm going to sit on this cooler, crisscross applesauce with my How fingers. Did, I, Matt, I'm surprised you kept a straight face when Travis asked, Travis Haley was asking you if you meditate. Yeah, it's, he doesn't. We've never met, so he doesn't know me. So. I, it's I, funny because I had you don't a look of, like you meditate. Not to be a, like profiling you or whatever, but you don't I look a, like you meditate. I had a bunch of guys that you know from the from the troop that were like sent me signal messages immediately, like, "Oh, you meditate and you meditate." I was like, <laughs> "Man, Andy, Andy was like, oh, you're drinking is fourteen drinking fourteen beers considered meditating?'" I was like, "Yeah, dude, motherfuckers don't know. Like, you're not." No, I don't meditate. I don't sit fucking Indian style on my garage floor and try to figure out my fucking thoughts. I don't understand that. It's good for whatever. If that's your thing, that's your fucking Pat. thing. I don't need Pat that Mac. in my life. So they're asking Pat. about Pat Mac. Oh, Pat Mac. That's the easy button. What do you want to know about old fucking T Max? I th I mean, I think that persona, like, that's really him from what I've heard. I know guys that live next door to him, and they love him. He's like, he's a great guy. He's a nice guy. So I will say, yes, the the times I've met uh, Pat when – What's when the bar was, there? What's when the bar he was, there? Scooters, is it? Or what the fuck is it called? Uh, O'Donnell's. Oh, um, that's – I see them the there. Jefferson. I've seen them there. Yeah, Pat is a phenomenally pleasant person to be around. Pat is super nice. When I first started shooting at Trigger Time, Pat was like, introduce himself. He's super nice at any informal at the unit. Go up and talk to him. Super nice. He is a genuinely nice guy. Like, that's not the issue with Pat. It's never, hey, he's he's not a good dude. No, I'll drink a fucking 100 beers with Pat. He's... He's super nice. The problem is what Pat says isn't true. <laughs> Period. That's it. Like, it's not that Pat's not riding little birds into Fallujah. That never happened. Uh, never came into a alleyway and shot some dude with his 45. That never happened. Like, you're, you're overselling your experience. That's my issue with it. Like, it's not. You're a super nice guy. You're an amazing dude. I, I'm glad all your neighbors like you. I'll tell you what, though. Your fucking stories are not correct. Yeah. I, I mean, who's, there's one guy. One guy. Uh, who the hell is it? Pre, is it Pressburg saying he shot somebody with a 45 from like 50 yards away? Yeah, <laughs> dude. It's, it's all that same thing. If you, If you get these dudes that. Their business is marketed off of what they did in a supposed military unit. Like, it's Paul probably, Harrell? it's probably no. not Paul Howe. Is that Paul? No, Paul Harrell. Is that the the like, NRA the magazine that... come to life guy that does a YouTube channel that's yeah. super pedantic? Dude, he's yeah. Paul Harrell's nuts. I think he, like, killed somebody at a campground or something. Oh, I don't know that. I don't know. Oh, no. Yeah, he did. Pressburg did shoot somebody. He was drunk, though, in his defense. Pressburg, yes, right. Pressburg did shoot somebody. He shot his brother-in-law. He was drunk, though, so it's it's fair, yeah? yeah, yeah. It's whatever. It's, it's funny there. But Chuck's guy's a little dog. He's in his little world. He's doing amazing things. <laughs> Lucas, Paul Harrell is a gem. He's super nuts. I mean, I can't make it through any of his videos. I turned it on, I was like, 
this is a 38 versus a th this, and it's like, fuck, I don't give a fuck about this. I'm not watching this. All right, let's talk about this. Joe put a good one up. Ben, okay. What the fuck are the fascinations with B8 bullseyes? I, this is my theory. This is my theory. 